Okay, welcome back after the break. We still have uh, Prince and Kanan and Siddharth to join us. Okay, so before the break, we looked at uh, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 2. Now we'll move on to verses uh, 3 to verse uh, 7. So can one of you read verses 3 to verse 7, please? Uh, sorry, you, you can go ahead and read, yes. Okay. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engage in warfare in angels himself at angle himself with the affairs of this life. This That is may please him who enlist him as a sol soldier's. And also, if anyone complete his ath athletics, he is not crowd unless he completes complete. according to the rules. The hard hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Okay. Thank you, Kiran. So here Paul is uh, uh, mentioning or uh, presenting through analogies. Analogies are something you know, similar to something else. So he's, uh, he's trying to highlight a few characteristics uh, for Timothy on how to be a good minister of the Lord. And so he's presenting three analogies here. First of a soldier, then of an athlete, and then of a farmer. Okay, so three analogies, soldier, athlete, and farmer. And uh, he's trying to highlight a few characteristics on how to be a good minister of the Lord from these three analogies. So he's telling uh, Timothy, you know, endure hardships like a, a soldier. You know, being a man of God, uh, serving uh, God is not an easy thing. Okay, and he says, you're now like a soldier. Okay, uh, so if you want to serve God, you know, it's the, it's not a life of, for ease or comfort. Yes, there are going to be difficulties. It's not going to be totally, you know, filled with uh, pain and suffering and difficulties, but it's also not going to be easy and it's not going to be a comfortable life. Uh, we need to be ready to go through uh, hardships and difficulties. Uh, and be like a soldier. A soldier is always ready for the call of uh, duty, just like Dave was explaining. He's always there at his post, always there doing his responsibilities, irrespective of uh, whatever his physical needs are. He won't care for them, but he will be there uh, to do what his commanding officer or uh, in chief the officer, the commanding officer uh, has, uh, has asked him to to what the chief commanding officer has asked him to uh, do. So we see that a soldier is always ready for the call of duty. A soldier who lives with his uh, family and has his children, you know, uh, uh, when there's a call of duty, he's ready to leave everything and uh, you know, uh, just respond to the uh, call. That means he's not caught up uh, with his and or entangled with all of his family affairs, his wife, his children, uh, but he's always ready on the uh, call of duty. Okay, uh, and you see that no man who is a soldier gets entangled with the affairs of this life. And Paul is telling Timothy, we need to live that way. We need to be always ready uh, to do what God is calling us to uh, do. Now, having said that, it does not mean that a soldier should not fulfill his uh, responsibilities towards his spouse or to his family or parents or his children. Yes, he does. But what we're saying here is greater than that. This is called for duty. And similarly, it does not mean that, you know, once we are serving God, that we don't take care of our spouse or children or our parents. Uh, you know, we do. We have to. Uh, that's also God-given responsibility, but uh, what Paul is saying is that we need to be always ready 
uh, to what God calls us to do and not be entang get entangled with the wrong things, but keep ourselves free to do what God has called us to do. Okay, so that is the analogy of a soldier, how, we, uh, how as a man of God, he needs to be a soldier. And the second thing he talks about an athlete. Now, an athlete, you know, he trains very hard, he disciplines his body, he works hard uh, so that he can win the race. But for him to win the race, he needs to compete according to the rules. He has to take part and run the race uh, according to the rules that are already set. So, for example, if an athlete is uh, running a race, you know, uh, he needs to only start, uh, he has to be at the starting point firstly, then he can only start when he either hear the whistle blow or when the gun, you know, the gun shop, he hears the gun shop. That's when he can start the race. He can't start it whenever he feels like running the race. And he needs to keep in his own lane. He cannot change the lanes. And he has to reach the finish point. He has to cross the finishing line. And that is when he can win the race or he can be assured of getting a uh, medal. So Paul is telling Timothy in the, in the same way, we need to serve according to God's terms and not according to our own terms. We need to meet God's requirements, we need to meet his standards, and we need to complete by his rules. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to uh, come uh, align ourselves uh, to the standards that he has placed for us. Uh, and we know that God has standards for his uh, call that is placed on our lives, and we need to live by those standards. Okay? So that is the analogy uh, that is presenting of an athlete, okay, competing according to the uh, rules. The third analogy is that of a farmer. Now we all know farmers are very hardworking. Uh, you know, only a hardworking farmer can enjoy the fruits of his hard work, can enjoy the harvest. Okay, if he does not work hard, he just sits there idle, not doing anything. There will be no harvest. There will be no fruits. So a hardworking farmer will enjoy the fruits of his uh, hard labor. So without hard work, there can be no harvest or we cannot enjoy the fruits. In the same way, when we serve God, it's uh, not something that is going to be very comfortable and easy. It's, uh, it's going to be hard work. We need to labor. We need to work hard. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, God, as he has his promise in his work, will bless the work of our hands and we will enjoy the fruit of our labor. God will bring about a great and a rich harvest. Okay? And then verses 8, uh, he says, remember that Christ Jesus. Now this word remember, Paul does not give uh, this as a warning because it was something that uh, Timothy might easily forget. But he said it because Timothy needed to be reminded to keep this in the forefront of his message. Now, what does he need to keep in the forefront of his message? That Jesus Christ is the seed of David. Uh, Timothy needed to keep this fact, uh, uh, you know, present this fact or teach this fact or preach this fact that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel who gave him the seed of David. And this was supposed to be the forefront of his preaching. The next thing that, uh, you know, he was raised from the dead according uh, to my gospel. So he was raised from the dead, uh, which is uh, the greatest fact uh, and also the greatest credential of the authenticity of uh, uh, Jesus Christ that he was resurrected from the dead. Now this phrase, seed of David, uh, it means that Jesus, uh, you know, that's uh, it means. It, uh, and why is Paul saying you need to preach it and teach it? It means that uh, Jesus was fully God, uh, but when he says that he was raised from the dead, you know, it also means that, uh, sorry, when he means that Jesus is, uh, came as a seed of David, he means that Jesus was fully man, uh, who was raised from the dead, which means that Jesus was fully God. So it was essential for Timothy to remember and teach this truth about who Jesus uh, was, that he was fully God and fully 
man. How is he fully God? I gave him the seed of David and he was fully man because he's a fully God because he was raised from the dead. And Paul says, according to my gospel, uh, you know, the gospel of Paul was somebody who felt he was entrusted with the gospel, he was a custodian of the gospel, somebody who was to guard the gospel, and hence he was not ashamed of the gospel, and he felt that the gospel belonged to him. Uh, in that sense, you know, he preached it, uh, uh, but also he says it belonged to him in the sense that he believed in it, not just preached it, uh, but he also believed in it, and it was his gospel, and it should also be the gospel of each one of us individually. That means we need to take ownership of the gospel in the sense that we need to believe it, we need to live by it, uh, and we also need to uh, preach it. That's when we show that the gospel belongs to us. Okay, And he says this is because of this gospel that we preach, you know, uh, we will endure hardships uh, and when we endure these hardships, when we go through these hardships, when we persevere, when we endure, uh, it is so that others can obtain salvation. So Paul is telling Timothy, see I'm preaching the resurrected Savior and look at me, where I am now, I am in chains. Uh, so he's telling Timothy that he's not just telling him to be like a soldier, a farmer, an athlete, uh, you know, telling him that he has to endure hardships and that uh, serving God is not going to be easy. Uh, but he's saying, look at my own life. You know, I too, I'm suffering. Uh, like somebody who is a, like an evildoer who's done something wrong, uh, you know, for preaching the gospel. Uh, and that is why I'm in chains. But he's saying that, uh, you know, he's saying that he's in chains, like as if to say he's an evildoer, but he's not done something that is evil. But he's saying he's in chains because he is preaching this eternal gospel. And uh, so he doesn't mind being in chains because the uh, oh, eternal gospel that he has preached, uh, you know, and he will truly continue to do so, is so that others can receive salvation. Okay. So we need to also be mindful of this that uh, when we serve God, it's not going to be easy. Uh, we need to be like a soldier, an athlete, and farmer. We have to endure hardships. We need to work hard. We will reap the harvest, the fruit of our work. Uh, but uh, we need to understand that uh, you know uh, the gospel that we preach. We just have to uh, own it for ourselves. Own it in the sense that we believe it and preach it, so that others can receive um, salvation. Okay. Any questions, any doubts on this uh, verses? If not, we will move to verses 11 to verse 13. Can somebody read that, please? Verses 11 to verse 13. Anyone like to read verses 11 to verse 13? Hello, class. No one's there. Is anyone there? Yes, ma'am. I'll like read. To read. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, no, at Lystra. Uh, what persecution? No, Thomas, sorry to interrupt. Are you reading in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13? Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, my page in the, the verse, chapter no 3, worries. one moment. Yeah. I didn't notice it. Okay, one moment. 11, right? 11. Yes, 11 to, 11 to 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we, sh we, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Thank you, Thomas. So this is our hope. Uh, 
in the midst of uh, enduring hardships that uh, and Paul is giving and sharing his hope with Timothy, uh, you know, that if we die, uh, we would live with Christ. You know, we would uh, die, but we have the assurance, the hope of eternal life, uh, which is already mentioned about in the previous verses in the previous chapter. Then he says, if we endure hardship, we are going to reign. Uh, so this is a hope that all of us have that, you know, uh, uh, if we endure, we don't give up, you know, we will reign with Christ in his million and kingdom. Uh, and if we suffer now, uh, we have this hope that we will reign with him. On the other hand, there are severe consequences of our denial. Okay, it says uh, if we deny him, then God has no choice but he will uh, deny us. Okay, uh, Jesus says about this, he says, whoever, uh, you know, confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. Okay, so when Jesus uh, said that. So, um, uh, so when we deny Christ or when we become faithless, it impacts us, uh, but it does not change anything from God's side, from his end. Uh, we know that his nature never changes. He's the same as today and forever. Now, there is a difference between denying and faithless. Denying means outrightly saying no. Okay, So that is what. When we deny Christ, when we outrightly say no, then, uh, you know, he has no choice but to deny us. But faithless is, you know, we go through moments of uh, when our faith is wavered, when our faith is weak, when our faith is uh, shaken, uh, you know, um, but God understands uh, us, he knows our frailties, he knows our weaknesses, but he says that, you know, he will still remain Faithful. So that is the meaning of denying and being faithless. When we deny God, it's totally saying we don't have anything to do with Him. We don't want Him. Uh, it's saying a no to Him. And when we do that, God has no other choice but denying uh, us. But uh, when we are faithless, that means you know moments when we are weakened in our faith, our faith is wavered, our faith is shaken. Uh, uh, you know, but God, uh, we still remain faithful. Okay. Um, and uh, it means that, you know, when we go through those moments of, being, of faithlessness, uh, we can always get back to God. He is not changed. He will never change. He will still remain faithful. Uh, he will revive us uh, and he will take us to higher levels. Um, and, uh, you know, he stays faithful to us even in our ups and downs. Okay. And verse uh, 14, uh, can one of you read verse 14, please? Dave, would you like to read verse 14? Seven. Keep reminding God's people of him, these things. Warn them before God against quarreling uh, about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Thank you, Dave. So here uh, Paul is again reiterating the same thought. He says that, you know, uh, Timothy preach, teach, exhort God's people. Uh, in the church community about all these things and what are these things about enduring hardship, uh, how to be like a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, uh, you know, how to uh, remain faithful to God and not disown Him. So it says, teach all of these things uh, about how to endure hardship for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to be ashamed of the gospel. And uh, he says that... Uh, you know, we must also teach and exhort people to stay away from uh, engaging in useless uh, uh, thoughts, useless things, arguments, um, uh, you know, and fighting over words, ideas, arguments, because it does not benefit anyone. And I think Paul is feeling like writing about this from, you know, first Timothy being seen about it. He says, don't uh, waste your time. Uh, you know, don't uh, engage in these people who, you know, uh, try to bring about arguments and, uh, uh, you know, fight over words because 
all of this is not going to help anyone. It's just going to bring in more strife, more division. Uh, but when you teach and preach God's word, that is what will build you up. That is what will strengthen you in the faith. And this is what we have spoken out uh, from uh, First Timothy chapter uh, one, and He's reminding him again these things. You know, uh, keep preaching, keep exhorting, and teaching people about all of these things. Okay, verse fifteen. Can one of you read verse fifteen, please? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a uh, workers who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly di dividing the words of truth. Thank you, Kiran. So here it says be diligent, which means be focused. And uh, you know, uh, being diligent is something that's not a one-time thing. It's something that is ongoing. It's a continuous work that has to be pursued carefully uh, with earnestness. And he is telling uh, Paul is telling Timothy to be diligent in three things. Uh, be diligent, uh, firstly, to present yourself approved to God. That means live in a right manner before God, walk in a right manner before God. The second thing that he says you need to be diligent is be diligent as a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Uh, that means work in a way that you are not ashamed before uh, God, uh, fulfill your calling. Fulfill what God has asked you to do so that you don't stand ashamed, you don't feel guilty and condemned uh, before God. And the right thing, the third thing that you need to be diligent about is rightly divide the word of truth. And uh, Timothy, yeah, be careful how you handle, how you preach, teach uh, uh, the word of God. Uh, you know, um, rightly dissect it, say the truth as it is to be said. You know, in a plain way, uh, you know, don't uh, take any other means uh, to explain it, but be straight on uh, right in the way you explain or preach or teach God's word. Then verses uh, 16 to verse 18. Uh, can one of you read that, please? Verses 16 to verse 18. Verses 16 to verse 18 says, But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Uh, so Paul is telling them they don't involve in idle and silly talk. Uh, and then he mentions two people, men here, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Um, you know, Hymenaeus is mentioned by Paul also in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, all we know about these men, we don't know much about them, but all we know about them is that they are engaging in useless and ungodly talk, uh, and they are spreading, uh, you, know, uh, you know, wrong things, talking uh, wrong things, presenting wrong arguments and truths, uh, and that is uh, being very, uh, you know, it's destroying the faith of people, it's being very destructive um, uh, uh, in the church, bringing about a lot of division and destruction, and uh, you know, Paul has dealt with them as he has mentioned in First Timothy, and so he's telling, you know, um, uh, don't uh, involve with them, or don't you know, involve in that idle and silly talk because their talk is spreading like cancer. That means everybody is just receiving it, uh, you know, hearing them out, and it's just spreading so fast and uh, like cancer also because it spreads fast and uh, it brings uh, death, it brings uh, pain, it brings, uh, uh, you know, uh, more joy, it uh, breaks down the whole body, the whole system. The way it functions. So he says, you know, these men, uh, the message that they're spreading is like uh, cancer. He says, don't have anything to do with uh, them. Okay. Verses 19 to 21. Can somebody read that, please? Verses 19 to 21. Can I read? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows uh, those who are His, and let everyone who name uh, names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But uh, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also uh, wood and clay. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself uh, from the latter he will be a vessel of vessel for a uh, honor sanctified and useful for uh, the master prepared for uh, every good work i'm sorry about thank the sound no no problem Simon. thank you um, so here paul is drawing an analogy from utensils that are used at home uh, you know, he says that in, in the home there are vessels or in our homes as well. There are vessels that we use for regular use, uh, regular day to day, ordinary use. And then we have you know, a special vessels that we use for special occasions, special purposes when we have guests at home. Uh, and, uh, you know, the owner feels a little, uh, you know, uh, excited or proud to. You know, have all of these special uh, utensils, uh, crockery, uh, you know, set of dinner sets or tea sets that they have uh, to display it uh, uh, and to use it when they have uh, guests, uh, to serve the guests, uh, just to honor them for, uh, you know, who they are and uh, serve special food in that. Okay. So to be a vessel for honor uh, means a vessel. You know, we need to be vessels that are used for special purposes, uh, for honorable use, uh, and a vessel that brings honor to God. So if you want to be a vessel that God wants to use, or he wants to put on display, or he wants to release his special purposes or his special anointing to us, then there are four things, um, four important requirements that uh, we need to fulfill to be that special vessel of honor. And I'm sure all of us would like to be that vessel of honor, uh, the vessels of honor where, uh, you know, we are used for special purposes for God, for an honorable use, uh, where God wants to, you know, put us on display by, you know, just pouring out his anointing through us, releasing his special purposes through us, giving us special positions, uh, or even uh, flowing to signs, purposes, and numbers to our life. If we want to be such people, then there are four important requirements uh, to be a vessel of honor. And if you note, he says, it says that here, uh, Paul says, if anyone, right? Um, yeah, in verse 21, he says, therefore, if anyone, so it means anyone, that means all of us can be those vessels of honor. Uh, so what are the four important requirements to be a vessel of honor? First thing is we need to be cleansed. That means we need to, uh, you know, depart from a life of sin. We need to not feed our sinful carnal nature, but we need to feed our spirit man. We need to grow in our spirit man. We need to starve the things of the flesh. That means not given to our fleshly carnal nature and desires of our carnal nature, that's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Uh, so uh, we also need to cleanse ourselves from dishonor. The second thing is we need to be sanctified. That means we set ourselves apart to basically doing what God has called us to, purposed us for, and uh, to be those vessels of the honor where his anointing can flow. So to be set apart for things, sanctified. You know, uh, the minute we are born again, the sanctification process begins. It's not a one-time thing, one-minute thing, one-day thing, or one event, but it happens throughout our life. And the extent of sanctification happens to the extent we are willing to submit and consecrate our lives every day. That much the Holy Spirit will work in us to sanctify us, um, to cleanse us, purify us, to present us blameless, holy, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish before the Most High uh, God. Okay, so we are set apart to be holy, just like a soldier 
uh, an athlete, a farmer, sets them set themselves apart to fulfill their specific calling, responsibility, uh, that or the position that they are in. We need to be useful. That means we need to be available uh, to God's call, be available to what He's asking us to do, and uh, to be uh, easily used by God. Not just holding on to our weaknesses, saying we can't do this, can't do that, not fit to do this, not fit to do that, but just available and also prepared. Uh, that is what all of you are doing, just being equipped uh, and being prepare yourselves to be ready to take on the call, the purposes, uh, to flow the anointing uh, of God. Okay? So all of us can be vessels of honor, uh, but uh, we need to work on those uh, you know, four important requirements uh, to become that vessel of honor. And remember, we uh, read in verse 1 uh, that uh, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, uh, is being given to us. In Ephesians chapter 2, we see that the grace of God has been lavished upon us. And so we have the grace of God who would enable us to be these vessels of honor. Okay? Any questions, any doubts so far? If not, thank we'll you, move. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, we'll move on to verse 22. Can one of you read verse 22, please? Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Thank you, Kiran. So in the view of becoming a vessel of honor, uh, we have only one choice, and that is to stay away from all ungodly lusts and passions, uh, and we need to desire or we need to pursue, that means pursue is keep going after, okay, relentlessly, you know, keep going after, never stopping, persevering, enduring, uh, righteousness, faith, love, and uh, peace. And we need to do this uh, because uh, with those who call and call and say, do this with those who call on the Lord of the pure heart. So here, there's an idea of togetherness, of community, um, meaning do this in a community of people who are doing the same thing, join with people who are also pursuing uh, faith, righteousness, love, and peace. Uh, so this whole thing that Paul is trying to say here is, uh, is bringing about the idea of togetherness, of community. He's saying, uh, or this meaning do this in a community of people who are doing the same thing, so it means that we need to live uh, in a community along with others who are also pursuing uh, righteousness, faith, um, love, and peace. And also, if you want to become a vessel of honor, then be the those who are doing the same thing. Okay, that is what he means in this verse. Uh, verses 23 to 26, can one of you read that, please? The last few verses, 22 to verse 26. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you have the, the produced quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but, make, but, must, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, opponents must be <clears throat> gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken the captive to do his will. Thank you, Dave. So here Paul is telling Timothy that every people will oppose you, people will oppose the gospel, people will oppose Jesus Christ, but when they oppose you, how do you handle them? How do you handle the situations? Okay, so firstly, he says, don't get into any foolish 
or ignore, uh, you know, ignorant disputes. Again, he goes back on the same thing that he's been talking and, and reminding him. Uh, he says, because when you, know, you get into all these foolish and ignorant disputes or arguments, you know, it will just produce strife, it will just produce division. And then he says, you know, instead, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must not uh, fight, must not get into strife, but uh, what must the servant of God do? He, must, he or she must be gentle and patiently teach people, uh, correct them in humility. Even those who oppose them, we need to teach them in all gentleness. Why is Paul telling Timothy that, you know, mentioning this? Why is he saying you need to be gentle with them, you know, fight with them, uh, you know, correct them in humility? Uh, because these people and not argue with them or fight with them because these people are taken captive by the devil. You know, they are the snare of the devil. Okay, so it's whatever you speak to them or argue or present your arguments, it's not going to do anything to them. It, it, it won't be able to help them. It's only God, it's only the Holy Spirit who can move in them, who can work in their lives to bring them to a place of repentance and to a place where they are able to embrace the truth so that they can come back to their senses and they can come out of the snare of the devil that they are in right now. Okay, So in that context, a servant of God should not argue, fight with them. It's going to lead them more astray. But just be gentle, loving, patient with them and teach them uh, so that the Holy Spirit and so that God can work in their lives and help them to embrace the truth, bring them to the point of the truth, where they can embrace the truth, and they can free from the snare of the devil that they are in right now. Okay. It also talks about uh, here the importance of prayer. You know, uh, you know, we can share with people, we can teach them, we can preach to them, uh, we can do this in love, patience, and gentleness. But we also need to engage in prayer because it's a bondage, it's a stronghold for some of them, okay? And it can, they can only come out of the snare or the bondage of the devil uh, who's ruling their lives, controlling their lives only by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of uh, God, okay? So that is what he ends this chapter 2 with, okay? A key takeaway is verse 21, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of hope, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Okay, so we need to be a vessel of honor. Uh, and we see that every instruction given in this chapter is directed toward this one very important call. That our calling is not something that is um, going to be easy, it's going to be difficult, uh, but we need to be vessels of honor so that we can honor the God who has called us, uh, who's anointing us, uh, who's releasing his work to us, and so that people can see the way that we conduct ourselves in honor and we honor the God that we serve. Okay? So that is the end of chapter 2. Anyone has any questions, doubts, any comments? No questions, no doubts. Okay, there are no questions and no doubts, and we'll end class. Thank you all for uh, uh, joining class. Okay. Uh, a test on First Timothy is on Feb sixteenth, uh, right? Feb sixteenth. Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so that is uh, next Wednesday. Yes. So please prepare uh, for first committee. Okay. Okay, thank you all for uh, joining class. Um, have a good day and I'll see you for the other classes tomorrow. I think we have no tomorrow with I don't have a class. I mean next Monday. Okay, see you all. Have a good week and a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Mom. Yes, Pan. Yes.
yeah how will be the exams it's uh, written or uh, oral 